Hey, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Uh, we're a webinar, webcast, online show, uh, whatever you want to call us. We are here live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. We do record the shows, however, so if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and see all and watch the recording later at, at your convenience. And I'll show you uh, where that is at the end of today's show, uh, where our website is and where you can see all of our recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So you don't have to um, sign into anything special, or join up in anything. Um, you don't have to register for a live session in order to see, um, have access to the recording later either. They're all just posted out there for anyone to see. Um, we do a mixture of things here on the show. Um, Interviews, book reviews, training sessions, demos of software serve product products sometimes. Uh, basically, our only criteria is that it has something to do with libraries, um, something library related. We um, <coughs> something some new things libraries are doing, uh, technology that can help out libraries. Uh, new services and products you might be interested in. Uh, sometimes some of our topics might seem a little um, out of the box, not like you're wondering, what does this have to do with me? Um, but trust us, the, everything eventually comes around to having to do with libraries <laughs> um, and all types of libraries, public, school, academic, uh, museum, um, anything out there. Uh, we have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff, some of our own staff that sometimes do presentations when we um, have things that are uh, services and things that we are promoting from here. But I, we also bring in guest speakers from uh, around the country, from both locally in Nebraska and around the country. And that's what we have this morning. On the line with us is Jen Eilers, and she is um, just next door to us here from Nebraska from the Iowa City Public Library. Uh, good morning, Jen. Good morning. And um, last, not last month, two months ago, October, I went to the Iowa yes. Library. Yes, it's already in December. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> I went to the, I attended the Iowa Library Association annual conference in October, and I saw uh, Jen's presentation on this there on the technology classes they were doing at the Iowa City Public Library. And um, it was very, I thought it was very um, interesting and in how, how she managed to pull all this off. And I invited her to come on the show to share um, what they did at Iowa City um, with a broader audience, hopefully. Um, so I will just uh, hand over to you, Jen, to tell us about what you've been doing at your library with all these um, awesome classes that you've got running. All right. Thank you, Krista. Um, so I'm Jen, and I've been working at the Iowa City Public Library for about three years. Um, I went to library school and graduated from the University of Iowa um, in 2013. Uh, before becoming a librarian, I actually worked for five years in a marketing and um, outreach department uh, where I helped people with uh, disabilities and traumatic brain injury. Um, so as we go through today, you'll see that background from marketing and outreach kind of come through in how um, I've, I've helped grow our classes here at the public library. Um, Basically, what I'm hoping that you'll get out of this uh, little talk here today is um, what I'm hoping is that we'll discuss some strategies for creating successful marketing tools within libraries and identifying marketing outlets outside of your library. Um, I also want to um, get you guys thinking about developing or finding assessment tools and measures that help you understand um, your patrons and the barriers to your service. I also want us to consider different ways and resources to keep your curriculum interesting and relevant, and we'll talk about method, methods to assess the resources your library has and how to use them in your classroom. Um, so those are kind of the things that we're going to get um, started with today. Um, well, the first thing I'm going to start with is uh, assessing, assessment um, and how to do that in your classroom. So when I started here at the public library, I inherited the technology classes and my boss um, has honestly said to me that she wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make uh, technology classes here uh, popular. They hadn't been very popular before I was here and um, I 
basically received a blank slate. I had no curriculum. I didn't have any participation in classes, and I wasn't entirely sure how we got the word out about technology classes at the library. I um, taught a few class. I, I made my own curriculum, and I taught a few classes, and no one attended, which I know a lot of libraries experience. So you put on, you plan, and you get nothing um, for all of that planning when no one shows up. So that's basically where I started with classes with zero to, to sometimes one person coming. Um, but now, after three years, I have seven to eight patrons coming per class, and we have over 28 different classes that we offer at the library on various subjects. And um, for those classes, we have instructor notes, and we also have uh, curriculum and handouts that are given to our participants. So while I didn't have uh, patron attendance, um, I, and I didn't have curriculum to work with, I did have a host of other resources um, that, that were critical for um, teaching technology to large groups of people here at the library. Um, when you start out to do your technology classes at your library, I suggest you kind of make a list of the resources you do have. Um, so I made a little goal when I, when I first started here because I had zero participation um, on occasion. I really just wanted to get one patron in each scheduled class that we had. Um, so my problem that I saw was that I didn't have patron attendance. I want to get one person here. And so I tried to brainstorm um, some potential solutions to um, getting folks in the door. And some things that I thought might help would be to offer night classes and weekend classes. Um, also, we have a great website. Um, we have a marketing department. So I was like, we need to get our uh, calendar of events up to date and our website entries for classes up to date and refreshed appropriately. Um, also, I talked to our marketing department to create a marketing plan. Um, so we figured out uh, what audiences uh, to target, where we were going to put information about classes um, in the community, and what pieces we uh, marketing pieces we might need to develop. And then um, I was also very, very lucky uh, to inherit with this, with my classes, I inherited a work group. And basically that meant that I had staff that were assigned to work on classes. Um, I had seven staff members, which is huge. Um, we are a bigger library for Iowa. Um, and I know that some, some libraries don't have those resources, but I understood that that was um, something that was going to help me make my classes successful. So I had seven, um, seven staff members who were captive to my vision, um, and I wanted to encourage those staff um, people when they were at their service points uh, to encourage uh, patrons when they saw the need uh, to promote our classes. So if they felt like um, a book didn't really fit or an online subscription to a database didn't fit that I wanted them to know about what classes we were teaching and uh, get them to talk about that at, um, at that you know reference interview or that interaction wherever they may be. Um, so when I was look as you can see with um, this little slide thing, you see the solutions there um, and I've kind of um, put a little asterisk next to all of those solutions, and then I've tied them to the resources. So what I had as far as resources went about um, saw getting those solutions into action was that I have extra hours and flexibility. So uh, I'm not a full-time librarian here. I only am contracted to work 25 hours, but I can get um, more hours, and so that allows um, me to have a little bit of flexibility in my schedule to say, you know what, I can add a few hours on a weekend or a night so that we can get those night classes and weekend classes scheduled. We also have an online calendar and um, a library website and web page for and web page specifically for our classes. Uh, that online calendar we just updated to make it a little bit easier to use. Um, so I understood that that was a resource that I needed to get my classes there. 
I'm also super lucky in that I have a computer lab with 20 um, seats within um, within the library with 20 computers and that it's a dedicated space and um, having that meant that I could have a large I could have a class up to 20 people and someday um, I hope to have that. Um, I'm also very lucky in that the Iowa City Public Library has a marketing department. We have a graphic designer on staff who's part-time, we have a graphic intern, and then we have a part-time PR person. And um, those people have expertise that I could rely on, um, even though I do have a marketing background um, and I have done design work, I can talk to them and see um, how to improve what we currently do and um, create create materials that they feel will be um, a good fit. Um, also, I had seven staff members, um, which I talked about before, that I could pull from. And another really important one was that I had five hours away from a service point. So some of you who have to be on a desk all day um, interfacing with the public, it can be hard to sit down and write some curriculum, but I was very lucky in that I have five hours um, of my 25 hours that I have to design curriculum. So when you are thinking about um, your solutions to the problems that you've faced once you've matched them with some of the resources that you've brainstormed. Um, you should really give your solutions time to realistically work and then assess their effectiveness. Um, some questions you probably want to consider are how will I measure the outcomes of my solutions? Um, am I using the right resources to solve the problem? Does my goal need to be adjusted? Are there other solutions that might work better to solve um, this problem? So before you decide whether or not your solutions are a good one, are good um, to solving your problem, really sit down and consider and assess those. And, and these questions hopefully will give you a good place to start with that. The next thing we're going to talk about is assessment tools. And this is probably the best way to get good feedback so that you can accurately decide whether the solutions you've come up for solving your problem actually are working. Uh, the Iowa City Public Library has an 11 question survey and a comment section to gather feedback from the class, class participants. I'm going to quickly show that to you just a minute here. So this is our assessment and it has the first seven questions really gather qualitative data about the class and the class instructor. I, I want my students to evaluate whether or not they felt the instructor was a good fit for the topic and I also want to make sure that the problem that they had with the enjoyment of their class isn't dependent on the subject. Um, or the teacher, but maybe how it was organized. I just want to get some good feedback about how they felt the class went as far as the material covered and whether or not the teacher was a good fit. So that's where um, the first seven questions kind of lie. The next questions, eight through 10, I want to get some information about my patrons. What, what are their skill set? You know, who is coming to my classes? And then um, I want to know how they've heard about our classes. That's really important um, to report back to my marketing department so they know exactly um, what marketing tools that they're using are effective, um, what things we can improve. And then finally, the last section is that comment section. And I it's unstructured. So the rest of the questions we designed in a way to make it very easy for patrons to kind of just check a box or circle something um, so that they're not having to think very hard and it's, it, it makes the assessment quicker to fill out and doesn't take as much time. But I also wanted to give them a, a free space to give feedback, any kind of feedback they wish. And so in the comment section I receive things like, thanks, this was a great this was a great class. I really enjoyed how you presented the information. 
or it could be something as simple as I couldn't hear you very well so you need to use a microphone or turn up the sound a little bit so that comment section I feel like is a very important part of the paper survey that we give now we did decide to use um, a paper survey and um, that was a very purposeful choice and I'm not saying that a uh, a paper survey is the way to go it just was a good fit for um, for our library and um, Jen we do I do have a uh, question about your survey Okay. Um, first, I think it's uh, really great. Uh, I was just myself thinking um, when you were talking about the different questions that there are so many different variables that can go into what was makes what, what made a, a, a particular class successful or not. Like I said, it was it the format, was it the the, the instructor, was it the content, um, or and especially that I like the part about the um, the comfort level of the um, patrons or was it just something you know they weren't at the right level for that particular class um, so I think it's a really good document and actually other people think that too um, well, can we get a copy of that um, that someone wants to know if you would include that in the, like the show notes afterwards if you send me the, the, something like that so that people can um, borrow from it for their own assessments or surveys Yes, I will be happy to do that. Okay, great. Yeah, send it to me, and when when I put up the recording afterwards for everyone, I will include this um, along with um, that so that you can get a copy of it and use it um, for yours. Excellent. Cool. And we do have a question um, about using the computer sure. lab, but um, I mean, I suppose I could ask it now, or if, I don't know if you're getting into this, about um, you said you do have a, a computer lab specifically that you use for all of these yes. classes? Okay. Um, for these classes, yeah. Do you close it to public access when, when, like, do you close down the lab for just when these classes are happening, and or is it, and what's the reaction to for the of the patrons who want to access the lab during the time you have in classes? Do you have other workstations elsewhere for them so that it's not really an issue? Yeah, so we have, basically we have the computer lab, which is 20 reserved computers in an, like it's in a classroom space with a door. So when we are teaching a class, people cannot go into that area. It's actually a closed space um, just in general. We have another area for uh, computer use. We have 40 computers on our second floor mm -hmm. that patrons can access at all times. So the, the computer lab is a dedicated space for uh, we we also uh, rent that's a silly word but we rent it out to um, other groups so during the mm -hmm. year if we have like we have uh, the volunteer we have a volunteer tax group that comes in to help people with taxes they use that space so it's used by other community part um, community people who need computer access who don't have it in the community for free as well so it's not just for classes but it isn't open it really isn't accessible to the public right oh okay not just it's not just open for at, at, even at other times so they they wouldn't right, even be, they wouldn't right. even be thinking cuz i've actually taught in class in classrooms computer labs and in libraries where apparently it is also a, like open for anyone to use when there's not a class going yes. on and pe people peeking in the window or looking and wondering, hey, why can't I get into Yeah. <laughs> so it's nice that you have this whole separate yeah, yeah, you know, I, area. Yeah, it's a huge resource. It's a huge resource. I know not all libraries are lucky enough or, mm -hmm. to have such a thing. So, yeah. yeah, I can understand how that could be a barrier. Okay, cool. Um, is, there, is, that, is there any more questions? Or? Um... Can I keep talking? Mm -hmm. Yep, go right ahead. Yep. Oh, someone just said that they have a, um, someone else has a, as a survey that they use as similar questions. Did your skills improve as a result of this class? Um, so, you know, getting their opinion yeah, of it would just tell them to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's good for when you're trying to Excellent. talk to administrators or uh, uh, money people that, look, the people are actually saying these were what if they helped them. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, proving, proving to, I mean, I collect my data 
data for my classes, but I also collect my data for my board and for my mm -hmm. director, who I'm like, no, no, this is a service we should provide to our community. Mm -hmm. um, but let's let's keep providing this. <laughs> yeah. a, uh, that, that is another way that the that the assessment is a is an important tool. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, definitely, it, it it double teams. It's not just a way of doing your classes better, but um, a way of proving to your your board and your community that this is a valuable uh, resource uh, for for your um, for the community that you're serving. Right, so, and it's not just yeah, it's a double you duty. As the as the librarian is coming from the actual the citizens use it. Yeah, exactly. Proof in the pudding. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so um, just type a question about <laughs> your hours <laughs> um, that you said that. Uh, oh. Uh, the, the 20 hours a week that you work for them is the five hours away from the service point in addition to that 20 or as part of that 20? When you're talking so about I'm 25 hours, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. So I'm 25 hours, so I have 20 hours on a service point essentially and then five hours that are dedicated to desk work, like where I can sit down and, and work on curriculum. Do all the behind the scenes things that need to be done in order to get these classes. Right. Yeah, all right. Exactly. Up and ready. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. All right, go ahead then. We're caught up on our questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, those are great questions. Thank you. Um, so we have our we have our paper survey, and um, as Krista kind of mentioned, you know, we I use that for four classes, but also for board members. And um, we, in addition to this uh, qualitative data, which is essentially what you're getting from your paper survey, I also capture quantitative data. Um, and quantitative data for us is um, I collect information about attendance numbers per class, uh, total registrations per class, I do date, time, uh, location of the class. So while we have that wonderful computer lab, I also take classes out to the community for members that um, maybe struggle getting here. So I've taught classes at retirement homes and um, actually I will teach class next week at the shelter uh, for people that are looking for jobs um, in, the, in the coming year. So I will teach them a resume skills class at the shelter where they're at. So I also look, record that location information and the two together uh, really provide a very um, full picture of what our classes are doing and they also give me a, a full picture of how I might be able to um, find better locations, uh, find better times for my classes and find little tweaks and improvements um, to who I assign to a class, how I teach a class, um, tweaking of curriculum. So by capturing all of this data it, it it can really make um, the classes that you teach uh, fit with the feedback that you're essentially getting in, in various ways from your community. Um, so we did end up going with a paper survey. There are lots of uh, great tools out there and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, that can help you if you don't have the time and energy like I made this paper survey. I record all of my stats, both the, the qualitative data from the uh, survey as well as the quantitative data into a, an Excel spreadsheet. That just seemed to work best for me. I like having that kind of total control and I also like entering that information because it, it gives me immediate feedback um, of how my classes are going. Those were just choices that I made based on my my personal skills um, and and what I felt was necessary to to, um, to get kind of a fuller picture but there are great tools if you do not have the time or um, the skills to do this kind of assessment so um, for us it was it was that I did have the Excel skills I, I mapped all of this kind of stuff in Excel from my previous job, so I know all the little tricks and, and whatnot um, in using that program. Also, it seemed easier for our patrons who had lower computer skills or beginning p computer skills to fill out a paper survey than have to do something on a computer. 
So um, we, I did kind of try an online uh, form, and it it didn't get the return um, as it didn't get a return a, as good of a return as a paper survey did. So that was kind of why I tried both, and this was the be the better choice for us. Um, it doesn't mean that that will be the case for you. So definitely try those out. Um, and I, you know, again, I have five hours away at my desk. It takes me like 20 minutes to input this stuff or less. Um, and I have the time to do that kind of analysis and data entry. That may not be something that you can, you can do. So when you're considering, uh, finding an assessment tool, um, here are some questions. I've, I've had these up for quite a while. Um, would a paper or online survey work better for getting patron feedback? And I would encourage you, if you have the time, to test to test both both um, both options. Um, when do you want your patrons to assess your technology class or your class in general? Immediately following your class um, through an online survey sent in an email at their convenience. Um, either of those could be a great um, can be a great ad asset. We give ours immediately after the class. I wanted fresh, fresh feedback. I wanted the captive audience. Um, but I've heard of um, online surveys sent um, behind being a very effective uh, tool as well. Um, again, you want to ask yourself, how much time do I have to record my data? How much time um, to do data entry? How much time do you need to analyze the data? There are some great tools that will do the analysis for you. How frequently do you want to do this analysis? Um, I know that technically I only have to report information to my board um, every July, so once a year, but I actually find it very helpful in um, managing my classes to look at data pretty much as often as I possibly can. So um, that that's how I've uh, kind of answered that question for myself. And then what other data would be useful um, to determine the sec success of your class? So I have you know, class attendance, location, time, those those may not be important. Over a time of recording that information, you might decide that that really isn't um, helpful data and you're just wasting your time. Um, so again, it's just critical thinking and assessment constantly. I'm constantly tweaking and um, I think that that makes our, our classes uh, better because that, of that constant kind of evaluation and tweaking that happens. So here are some examples of some great assessment tools that are out there. I'm going to just kind of quickly run through some of their uh, benefits. So there's Google Forms. Uh, if you have a Google, if you have a Gmail account, they're free and easy to use. You can customize the form. Um, the data is compiled for you. So you create the form and um, it creates basically a spreadsheet of all of that information. So instead of having to go through and and figure out a method for capturing how many people said that your class was great, um, it compiles those answers for you. So that can save you a lot of time. And then uh, it does not do the analysis of that of those spreadsheets for you. You would. You could use the tool within Google Forms, the spreadsheet tool, or you can actually um, export it and then use a different tool like Excel to create graphs and do the manipulation um, yourself as you choose. Another great tool is SurveyMonkey. Uh, again, it's an online software that allows you to create surveys and analyze your data. Uh, the tools are, that are offered um, are free. Um, they're basic, and you can only create surveys that have 10 questions. That's kind of a, a pitfall of it. Um, and you can only capture 100 responses. So after 100 people have taken the survey, you either have to upgrade and, and purchase an account with SurveyMonkey, or a way of getting around that would be to sign up for a new account and create a new a subscription, but then your data is going to then be housed in like several different places, which isn't necessarily ideal. And if you can't afford a subscription, um, it might not be a great tool for you, but it's definitely something to look at. Another tool is Project Outcome. 
Uh, this project was launched by the Public Library Association. Um, it's a three-year project, and it began in 2015, so we're kind of midway through, essentially. Um, when your library signs up to be a part of Project Outcome, you get access to surveys and measurement tools designed to help um, you measure the effectiveness, effectiveness of your program and uh, build persuasive arguments uh, for your board and for your community to, uh, to garner more funding. Um, if you are looking specifically at doing classes, they have digital inclusion and education and lifelong learning as uh, two core areas where they have pre-designed tools and surveys. So the thing with Project Outcome is that it's all built for you, which is great if you don't have the time, um, but it isn't something that you can manipulate or uh, design yourself. So if you're looking to save some time and, and you know, just want someone else to have done it and uh, have tested this out, uh, again, Project Outcome is a, is a very good resource. Uh, the the thing that can either be a, a, a boon or kind of a negative for you is that uh, the data is uh, that you enter is going to be shared with libraries across the United States. So how effective your classes are, that data is recorded and and um, will be shared uh, to get more data for uh, for the nation. Essentially, PLA is looking for more data to figure out. Uh, how effective libraries are in the United States. So that data will be shared, so that's something for you to c consider as well. And finally, the last resource that I'm going to talk about, there are other resources out there, but these are the top ones that I, that I wanted to present to you, uh, is Library Research Service. And this is a site that offers tips and strategies for collecting data creating surveys, and analyzing the data from those surveys. This organization uh, it conducts research about libraries and works closely with the Colorado library community. On their resources page, they offer some general how-tos and considerations for putting together an effective survey and understanding how to analyze it. They offer three general survey templates to get you started. So I've included some questions that I use to consider. The Library um, Research Service also has questions, and they also have some pre-designed surveys that you can use to get started. So it's kind of a bare bones, um, but again, if you want a little bit more control, it's a good place to start. Okay, we're going to move on to the next uh, selection or section here, and. Um, talk a little bit about creating successful marketing tools. And the first place that I recommend starting is creating a marketing plan that kind of maps out what you want to be doing, um, what your budget is, um, and how long you plan to test out various marketing strategies. Um, try a bunch of things to get, uh, to get the word out um, and saturate your community with information about your your service. So when I first came, I knew that part of the problem with people not attending was that they just didn't hear about our classes. And so I wanted to make sure that I I uh, I figured that out um, that that wasn't as big of a problem as it had been in the in the past. So what we do to saturate our community here at the public library for, here at Iowa City is. Um, we do a monthly press release to our local paper, The Press Citizen. And it's, I don't know, 250 words, and it's just a quick and dirty kind of, um, this is when we're doing a class, these are the skills we want people to learn, and we put that out in the local paper. Um, occasionally, I will write a longer um, column spotlight in the local papers, The Press Citizen and The Gazette. That's about 500 words about the effectiveness of our classes, kind of my vision for classes. Um, if I wanted to talk specifically about a suite of classes that we're teaching, like a lot of times um, in the spring we teach design classes uh, for graphic design, um, movie making, those kinds of things. I, I'll do a bigger piece um, for the paper to kind of get people excited and enthused about the skills that they might have the opportunity of learning if they signed up. I've also gone on local radio shows to talk about our classes. 
We have a Facebook page, a Twitter, and um, Instagram accounts that our marketing department posts to. We, I also do blog posts. Our library has a blog. I am routinely assigned <laughs> to write a blog post every three or four months, and I generally use um, that opportunity to talk about my classes. We also have um, a library website, and I try to get my classes in there as on as many different pages as possible and tie them together um, so that patrons are seeing that information on our site as frequently as they possibly can. And lastly, we have The Window, and it's a newsletter that we send out um, twice a month, or, or I shouldn't say twice a month, twice a year. Um, and basically, it is sent to everyone in Iowa City, um, and it just gives information about the projects that we're doing at the library. So I always try to see if there's a little bit of space uh, for classes on that tool, because everyone in the community will see it, and I want to make sure everyone in the community sees my classes. All right. Um, uh, so just, some of the marketing. Uh, we do have a question about some of your marketing uh, outreach. Okay. Um, basically, do you okay. have any way, and maybe you're getting into this, I don't know, of um, tracking how uh, many people read your posts? Like, are they actually being looked at? Um, your social media so, um, blog posts? Yes. So um, beyond... Uh, the assessment tool, the, the survey that we have, um, our marketing department can track the likes mm -hmm. of, a, of a particular view. They also, they get all sorts of statistics for our blog and website mm -hmm. as well to, so that when I want reports, um, I can get those. And a lot of times I don't worry about the website or um, social media posts until the end of the year. Um, but I can ask our IT department for that um, that kind of information. Cool, good. Yeah, that's good to know because sometimes you put those things out there and you have no idea if, if it's having any effect. <laughs> but it's good that you have people that can, that will look at that. I know, like on our Facebook, we do have we can see you know how many how many people it reached and for our tweets, how many times things have been retweeted or shared or anything. Yeah. Definitely, so definitely another good place yeah, to look I, at, yeah. Yeah, yep. Maybe not as frequently as some of the other data that you're collecting, but definitely mm -hmm. a valuable thing to assess. Yeah. Um, so when we were looking at our marketing, another, uh, another thing that we did was we developed specific uh, marketing tools for the library. Um, so we have these great little half sheets and I'm going to go out again and show you what they kind of look like here. Um, oops, this is not it. This is our data. <laughs> so we have this great um, calendar, and this has all of the events that the library does in programming um, for the library is on here. Uh, what I decided to do was also do a, so I planned my classes out for about four to six months, and um, we created this little half sheet that we have available at all of our service points, so at our circulation desk, at our information desk, at our page station, in our classroom. Um, this is plastered everywhere I could think of putting it. Um, and it just basically gives the classes their times and a little description. Um, and uh, it tells you how to register for our classes uh, so that we, you know, people are getting that information. And that's just, this is a tool that we only use in-house, so it's not something that goes out to the community or anything. It's something that's solely made for the library and the patrons that come through the door. And the same is true for this calendar. Uh, those takeaways are really important. Um, when I'm teaching, after I'm done teaching a class, I often pedal my little marketing tools. I'm like, hey, um, if you wanted, if you liked this class, please take a flyer and decide if you want to take um, another class with us. Another way that I market our classes um, is through our uh, class handouts. 
So at the very bottom of our class handouts, I also give another shout out to how they can find out information about classes in the future, where they need to go on the website and whatnot. Um, we have some posters as well around the around the library that tell about our classes. So those are just some. While I, you know, do a lot for the community, you also have to think about marketing within the library building, because um, that's that's where a lot of your your patrons. I mean, if they're coming to the library, the chances of them coming back to the library for a class are much higher than a community member who may not come to the library at all. Um, so it's important not to overlook your library space as an important uh, marketing grounds. And finally, um, or an, an, another strategy here, I, I know that we're kind of getting close to time, but um, you, uh, one of the biggest assets to marketing is actually your staff. So the more educated you can make your staff about uh, the class opportunities that you have, um, the better. It also energizes your staff to know um, the kind of effective things that you're doing within the building. Um, so I share class listings at staff departmental and board meetings. Um, if I can get on the agenda, I try. Um, I send emails or post information internally. We have an internal blog um, here at the library, so this isn't something that the public sees. So, like today, after I'm done speaking here, I will let my my um, coworkers know that I gave this talk and um, I do the same thing for my classes. I tell them when we had a great success or what we what might be coming up through that blog. So it's not necessarily being as pushy as emailing them constantly, but it's that, that information is available for them. I also will post my statistics to that blog um, yearly when I give that over to the board as well. Yeah. I also invite my, uh, my staff members to come to a class. As silly as that sounds, I want them, I mean, they may already have the skills, but I would I I do want them to be in that classroom and then I can get feedback from them um, as to whether or not uh, what can I improve, you know, what did they see, how did they enjoy the class? Getting that feedback from staff can be really helpful. Um, and it also, you know, gets them into this process. If you don't have seven staff members to you know, pull from, you're going to want to energize the staff that you do have working with you and partner with them a little bit um, to get them energized about, about your classes so they'll share that with patrons. Uh, Jen, we do have a question um, about that, actually. Um, again, just going back okay. to the uh, having the staff come, uh, is this done during their regular work hours? Did you have to work out something with other departments that it was um, allowed for them to come to your classes as part of their work day? Or was that an so issue? I did talk some, um, so our um, I'm very lucky in that our director is always looking for um, training opportunities <laughs> for uh, our staff and our staff just like our community has a wide variety of computer and technology needs mm -hmm. um, so she is perfectly fine with our staff if they have if they aren't assigned to a public service desk they have some downtime and want to come to our want to come to a class that I'm that I'm doing, they are welcome to. Um, we teach databases, and sometimes our our info, info staff need a little refresher, and it's oh, a yeah. good way to kill two birds with one stone. That was something so, I was thinking of. That this is a great way, yeah. for, rather than having to have a separate. We're going to teach the staff how to use this new service, or already like you said refresh them on it. Just have them come to a class that's already being taught, and they can learn right along. Yeah. Yeah, because we generally have enough seat. I mean, we'd have to kick them out if if we had a full classroom, but mm -hmm. a lot of times we don't, and so those seats seats are available for staff. So yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, um, and also one other when question, you're, um, one question, question about the marketing and social media, just a quick thing. Do they, do, do you know if your marketing department uses any sort of social media tools? Someone wants to know like Hootsuite or one of those services that can like aggregate things together? Or they just go I individually out? I know that they out? use, um, I, I think they schedule a post. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. that they schedule a post. They work, they work months in advance sometimes, and then I think they use a tool like Hootsuite. I'm not entirely sure if that's true. Yeah. Um, I don't really know the, the 
nuts and bolts, unfortunately. Um, but I do know Hootsuite does allow you to schedule posts. Right, um, they do. So mm -hmm. that it goes out in a appropriate time frame. Um, and I know that they do work ahead a lot of times so that we can get marketing out into the community a month or two in advance mm -hmm. just so that they're getting uh, an opportunity to hear it multiple times in multiple ways. Right. Okay, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, also, when you're thinking about uh, marketing tools, Tools, utilize your existing partnerships. So the Iowa City community has a senior center. So it's a center um, where seniors can go and uh, learn new skills or just be with other seniors, basically. And um, they're right down the street from us. A lot of the patrons that I see taking my classes are in that demographic. So I basically developed a partner partnership with that with that organization where I teach some classes over there and in return they send out information about our classes in their mailer to everyone um, that basically the senior center you have to pay some dues to be part of it so everyone that pays dues into the senior center gets a mailer every every uh, quarter and our information goes into that in return I teach classes for them um, so it's a very nice partnership. We get our information out to a demographic that wants to come to our classes, and we help the senior center pr provide classes that are interesting to their to their constituents. Um, also, I talk to I have connections at our recreation centers, our um, our city hall. Um, I don't do as much posting to churches, but certainly if there is a church in your in your area that uh, is an important community center, you would want to consider them as well. Um, but getting your posters and handouts um, to those areas can, can be a really great way of um, getting your community aware of what you're doing. Also be on the lookout for potential partnerships. So um, we had um, the Iowa City Tech Chicks. Um, which is a group of women that just focus on improving their tech skills and it's a very loose open group and they actually came to me and asked if I would be willing to teach their group specifically um, some some skills uh, so we did I used a YouTube um, curriculum we teach we teach using YouTube to edit video and they were interested in me presenting that to their group a couple of times. Um, also a group called Sense and Sensibility, it's an investment group, wanted to know about our investment databases and we saw that they were using our uh, our other rooms in the library and um, approached them and were like, hey, would you like a training um, on value line um, which is an investment database or Morningstar and they were really excited and and that captive audience also does help boost your like boost those numbers um, and shows that there's there's community value there so the you know look for look for ways in which um, groups that already exist already meet um, within your community how you might be able to help them you know do you know, accomplish their goals for their group um, with your technology classes. Um, and again, always assess, 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 assess your efforts. Um, we assess our efforts based on our um, how heard data um, through our web stats. And um, when you've when you've done your assessment over some time with your marketing tools, scale back. Don't be afraid to scale back. Um, if you don't, you know, maybe social media isn't where people are hearing about your classes. Stop scheduling posts. Um, it, you know, just because it's an effective tool for one library doesn't mean it's an effective tool for your library. Um, so, so make those assessments for yourself and um, and just do that kind of frequently. So. Uh, the final thing that we're going to cover today is uh, building a uh, better curriculum because you can get the word out, you can get you know an infrastructure in place for teaching your classes, uh, but essentially if the meat of what you're presenting isn't interesting, nobody's going to want to come. Um, so 
you can consider uh, different ways of keeping your curriculum interesting, and some of those ways is uh, bring in people from your community to teach and design new classes based on their interests or expertise. Now, I I do a lot of our own design um, of classes and curriculum, but we also are very lucky in having the the library school in town. So I often go and um, ask their students if they want to try their hand at making curriculum uh, for a computer class at a public library to give them uh, real experience, real world experience in something they might be doing in the public library they la land in. Um, we also have uh, pages here who when, and I asked them on a volunteer basis if they wouldn't mind designing curriculum. So we had a garage band class um, that one of our pages volunteered to create curriculum for and teach uh, because he used to be a sound mixer in Seattle and loves using garage band. It's a little pet hobby of his. So he was very excited to come and teach for us. And then he ended up teaching staff how to teach that class. So now he's handed the curriculum and um, has taught me how to teach the class effectively. So that was a great, that's a great um, way of considering building your curriculum, especially if you don't have dedicated time um, to creating your own curriculum. Um, also, figure out ways to make your classes more interactive. Uh, we essentially teach three different types of classes here at the Public Library. We teach a hands-on skill building class. So we have a GIMP class. So GIMP is a free open source uh, graphic design program. Um, we teach YouTube. We have GarageBand classes. Um, and basically what we're doing is helping patrons learn to use the software um, to complete a particular project. Um, so in our GIMP classes, we'll have patrons edit and touch up, touch up uh, scanned photographs um, to correct issues like water spots or whatever so that um, they are learning how to do, how to use a graphic design tool and kind of become more comfortable in general um, with technology. I, we talk about hotkeys, which is, um, or keyboard shortcuts, which is a useful skill to have just generally. Um, but then they're, then they're also learning specific, specific skills um, using a graphic design software. Um, and they are walking away with a product too, which I think is really important. Um, they are correcting a photograph that is meaningful to them um, in their real life. Um, and so those classes, those hands-on classes are really, are really great. Um, we also do lecture-based classes with discussion, and that's typically a librarian. It, a librarian is demoing a software or application like Facebook um, or our genealogy databases, and students are welcome to ask questions periodically to make sure they understand the programs um, as they work through um, going through that interface. Um, and then we have just kind of um, lecture-based classes with hands-on activities. Activities. Um, so one of the great classes that we teach here is um, a computer hardware class. And basically, we give a little bit of a lecture um, that kind of discusses the computer components. And then uh, we have old decommissioned computers that uh, patrons can then look in and say, oh, well, this is the motherboard. And this is where the motherboard is in this uh, broken up computer. Um, and they can kind of literally get their hands into um, the computer hardware to see how um, it kind of connects uh, with the information that was presented to them earlier. So those, those are three ways in which we kind of keep our curriculum interesting as well as having a wide variety of different topics that we, that we cover. Um, Again, I do have a couple I of questions. Out I do have a couple of questions that came in about sure. the classes. Uh, right, that. Um, how long do each of these classes usually last? Does it vary depending on the type of class? Yes. So um, if we're doing a hands-on skill building class, uh, a lot of times I try to allocate two hours um, for those classes just because you're trying to teach a software and you're trying to get a finished product. So um, we usually do teach those in two-hour chunks. All the rest of the classes that we teach are an hour long. Okay. And these classes are all free? Someone had asked this earlier. This all of them are free. Cool. 
All right. Yep, they're all free. Um, if you sometimes you just don't know what to teach, um, there are lots of times when I'm like, okay, our curriculum seems stale, but I don't really know where to go. I look back at my assessment data and I'm like, ah, we've taught all of this. Let's try something new. I don't know what to try new. Um, so I often survey other libraries um, like my own uh, to see what types of classes they're uh, teaching. So I basically look at size and type of community, and I know that Iowa City's demographics align well with uh, public libraries in Boulder, Colorado. Again, that's a small smallish town, a small community with a very large university. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, again, a smaller community with a very large university. Um, I kind of found census data to kind of help me make that equivalency. Um, so I kind of, whenever I'm kind of stuck, I kind of am like, okay, Boulder, what do you got for me? Or, hey, Ann Arbor, what do you got for me? Um, and there are other libraries, too, that I pull from that are similar in that way. Um, and so that kind of helps me figure out, oh, okay, well, if they're trying this with their, with their community. Maybe we can try that, too, here. So that's a way, a way of getting some ideas for uh, new, libraries, new library curriculum. Read about uh, technology online or from magazines. Um, mag magazine subscriptions are, I'm lucky in that uh, the library subscribes to a lot of tech magazines, and um, they get... We have a staff subscription, um, and they get pushed to my mailbox pretty frequently, and I, I can just kind of skim through those and see if I see anything interesting, um, go more in depth, um, and read those articles. If I'm sitting out on the information desk and it's kind of slow, I, you know, go to my favorite, my favorite tech blogs, um, the Washington, or even you know, New York Times, Washington Post, just kind of see what's out there, what's up and coming, what's in the the zeitgeist essentially of uh, technology to kind of decide: should I be teaching? Should I be offering classes on this new free um, software that's out there for people, or or what is the latest app? You know, I'm kind of always got my finger on that stuff. Um, I would also encourage you not to forget about open source software free and free online tools. Those are no overhead to your library to teach a lot of times because they're offered for free. Um, and those tools can be great resources um, to allowing your patrons to develop some skills um, that you would never thought possible. Um, Audacity is a free sound editing software and it's amazing. And um, We've um, we taught that class. We've um, taught classes like that in which people record a digital um, kind of a digital history soundbite where they they tell a story, kind of like StoryCorps. They tell a story and then they can then they can use that Audacity software to make sure that the sound clip goes well. They can cut out places where they aren't pleased with what they said necessarily or it didn't sound quite right. Um, and build a little sound bite that they can be proud of and happy with and share. Um, also, look look uh, for other places that have curriculum for free. Uh, GCFLearnFree.org, that's on the screen right now, um, has free online tutorials, uh, technology courses for basic computer skills um, from Windows 10 um, to uh, internet safety. If you aren't quite sure how to start out your curriculum, a lot of times I visit here just to kind of say, okay, what are the baseline skills that that GCF uh, wants people to know, and uh, and where do I go from there? Um, and they've been doing this for a really long time, so they they provide tutorial. They've been providing tutorials for ten years. They keep their tutorials fresh, so this is a great website to go to if you just need some curriculum kind of out of the box. Um, you don't want to think about it. It's, their curriculum is there, and it's great. Um, also, Learning Express, the state of Iowa provides this um, to our libraries for free. Um, sometimes I'll look at those tutorials to see if that's a good place to start, or um, a lot of times we don't teach a lot of proprietary software at the library because um, it's constantly changing and then we have to have subscriptions to that or we have to download that software. Um, 
so I'm very familiar of what's available in our library databases and when a patron has a question about Excel or something I can point them in that direction if that isn't something that we're going to teach here. Um, DigitalLearn.org um, this is another great software it offers or another great program or website it um, offers free videos PDFs of curriculum and PDFs of handouts um, online, it's a project by um, the Public Library Association. Um, so it's, again, if you don't have time to develop your curriculum, it's right there for you. Um, especially some of the very basic topics. It's all in out of the box. You can just read that through and then use that to prepare your class and then teach it. And then finally, um, the Denver Public Library provides instructor notes and handouts for all of the classes they, they teach in their computer technology classroom. And there is a link here um, for that curriculum. Um, this is something that I hope um, the, public, the Iowa City Public Library will do in the future. Um, Denver Public has already done it. So again, if um, you see some classes there that you think would be a good fit for com your community, you certainly can just take that curriculum. It's, it's there offered up for you um, and the community. So those are some great places to look at building uh, your curriculum. And as always, as I, I feel kind of like a broken record, um, revise, update, and, and tweak your curriculum as needed. Um, when you get those lovely assessments back, um, you might get something that's some feedback that um, is really critical in making your class better. Um, so integrate those suggestions into your curriculum and see if it see if that changes things up and, and makes it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, these are not that's static. basically these it. Not, it's great that these are not static classes. You can always change things and yes, yeah, nothing is in stone. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, we do have a few more questions that came in about what, what uh, you're talking about, about your curriculum and your classes. So, yeah, um, it is about 5 after 11 now. Um, uh, we do have some more questions coming in, but we'll, we'll, we will answer all of them. Um, since we started about 5 after, this is, a, this is um, on the dot for being our hour session, but um, we will just uh, continue until we get all the questions a asked. Um, if you do need okay. to leave any of you attendees, um, because we did hit the hour, um, that go right ahead. If you need to, we are recording. You can always come back and listen to the rest of the session um, on the recording later, later. But I don't think it'll take more than a couple of minutes. So if you do have any last minute questions, type them in, get them in there. Um, let me know and um, we can ask them before we go. Uh, one good question I have here is, um, it's kind of a, a I don't know. what is your best tech magazine or maybe what are some titles that you would specifically request as being really good ones you said look into them for ideas for curriculum um, I frequently look at computers and I think it's computers and libraries is mm -hmm. it bad that I just know what they look like <laughs> but computers <laughs> and libraries I often, <laughs> I'm no. pretty sure that's the title that that's that's that is, uh, one yeah. that I I do flip quite a bit Okay, and they, they do have um, a lot of their stuff is online as well, which is good. I know I've looked at some of their articles that are on um, on the website uh, for that one, yep. Wired um, is also very good for upcoming technology too. I mean, mm. the, like the biggies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great. Um, a couple of people did ask about promoting the classes themselves. Um, any interesting, how do you make them appear interesting? Um, you come up with creative and memorable names for the classes themselves to catch people's attention rather than just the, you know, GIMP for for editing or whatever. Um, you know, how do you, because people, they have <laughs> they have trouble with just getting people interested or wanting to come to the classes and they just say, we're going to teach Word or whatever. Right. Um, so I do have a little bit of a marketing background, so I, mm -hmm. I know how to write things for marketing. Um, and I do have those great uh, those great uh, marketing department ladies. Um, but I guess make them short and sweet. And um, what I found has been really effective for us is that I group classes per month. So 
I have, so in January of this year, we're actually teaching a lot of uh, smart, like uh, handheld device classes. So I'll group all of our iPad classes, all of our Android classes together. So when I do put out a press release, um, I can focus on how this is the month for um, your handheld devices. And um, I try to make the titles of the classes, I mean, they may seem kind of boring, but I, I shy away from gimmicky kind of sounding um, marketing. I want them to know exactly what they're getting. Right. It's kind of um, a fine line between being interesting and being confusing in what is this class? Because it's such a cutesy title that I don't even understand what I'm going to be attending. Yeah. Exactly. So a lot of times it's very basic. Like um, I for January, iPad tips and tricks, and then I give uh, two lines, learn useful tips and tricks for making the most out of your iPad, your iPad safe, um, getting the most out of your memory and much more. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think what's really um, be succinct about what kind of goals you have for the class um, and that that will tell your patron all they need to know um, you're not trying to trick them by sugarcoating it, essentially, you know. You want the words to be interesting and active, um, but you don't necessarily want them to be misleading or confusing. Mm -hmm. So, again, I just probably a lot of times get an use idea my of what you're doing by looking at the Iowa City Public Library website. You said you got your calendar of classes up there as well. I do, yes, yeah, and so. that, is, that is the test ground for... Um, <laughs> for how effective, you know, if I have low registration, I do kind of think, mm, should I be t should I be tweaking how I'm how I'm talking about this class? So, exactly. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, for do do you do? I know you, in your survey you do ask, you know, do they think these classes you know help them? Do you do skill assessments for classes at the beginning and end of the class to see did they where do they start at and when do they end at, where do they end at? Um, I don't do that. I know that you certainly can, and um, and that can be very helpful. But um, a lot of times, I the I think the question that uh, we ask, and I'm going to actually pull that up here because I can't remember exactly how we word that question. Um, but essentially, what I ask from that is. Did you learn a new skill or some information? And I, it's, it's, I let them decide. Um, I'm not necessarily as concerned if they can't, like, if they can reproduce copying and pasting in in GIMP. I, if they felt like they learned enough, that's good enough for me. Something new, something that they didn't know before. Right. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else we have here. There's a few more one questions. We don't want to go too long here. So, um, oh, here's a suggestions for marketing to a younger audience. Uh, I know you do mm -hmm. adult classes, so I don't know. So uh, with, I don't do a lot. Like I guess, um, I mean our our. Uh, our library classes are kind of skewed to an older demographic, and um, a lot of that has to do with the uh, with free time, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that a lot of people that are older have have a little bit more free time on their hands. They don't have a full time job or kids, mm -hmm. um, so it, it can well, be tricky some, to get some that. Libraries, I think that they would maybe a different department would handle the like if you're talking about teens or something that uh, different staff yeah, would handle that. And tweens, I, yeah, and I don't have uh, the experience with marketing to our teens and tweens. Now I know we have very successful programming for both of those groups, mm. um, but it's not really within my expertise to right. speak on that. No, no problem at all. Um, do you limit the class size for, um, well, specifically so this we person's asking for seniors, uh, maybe because they might need more individual attention, but... Um, so for our our hands-on classes, um, we do limit to ten 
people. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually have some sort of aid that we have some volunteers who can come in and kind of help me teach a class. So basically, I will give instruction at the at the front of the room, and then I have an aide that comes in and kind of helps shepherd everyone. Um, if they kind of get stuck, they can put their hand up, and then the aide will come in and help them. And um, I also will go out in the middle of instruction, again, why we, we block off two hours, um, so that we keep everybody together, together as best as we can. But yeah, we do cap those classes at 10 because uh, five seniors um, who might have uh, a wide variety of computer technology skills can be a, a bit demanding mm -hmm. um, right. to get through a project. You need to do a lot of more one-on-one uh, -on -one during the class. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. We have two last questions that we're going to uh, go through, I think, and then that'll be it. Just wrapping up. You can always contact Jen, of course, at um, her library if you do have any other questions we didn't get to. Um, something specific to um, doing the surveys. How often do you recommend comparing MAPS survey responses? Um, in this case, they are asking about having a smaller uh, class size. For example, if they only have like two to four attendees, how often do you do comparisons of, of what's going on, what's changing, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, so I, before I cut a class, like if I, we have a ton of classes. So um, before I decide that we're going to retire a class for a while, um, I map it for a full year. Um, and I, I try to offer it at least twice um, to, to make sure that, that it is something that I should be cutting. Mm -hmm. um, that goes along with what if, we were saying and before. If it has low so many f variables that could affect it. And time of year definitely you know, would be something. Certain things are more popular in the summer than in the winter or something. Right. Well, and even just attendance in general, like right. we, we dip really, really badly in um, November through January because it's tough for people to get want to get out of their homes. Mm -hmm. You know, we yeah. live in, in climates that are snowy. So yep. we're, we're like that here, too. Yep. And many of us with Midwest people, I know we yep. have on the line. <laughs> you <laughs> might buddy from the middle of the country. No, exactly. gets this. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly understands the, the the trials of getting people to programming in those months. Mm -hmm. And um, last question we have here: um, Do you find the service desk to be one of the biggest points for marketing? Um, this person wonders if some of their staff there are promoting the classes as much as they would like, and is there any way to help? You know, where do you think is the biggest place that um, you're getting most of your marketing out? Um, so I know just by our assessment data that it's our half sheets. Mm -hmm. um, so I I make the assumption that um, my coworkers and I've actually like because we're double staffed on the information desk, I've seen my coworkers hand them out. Um, so I know and I and I get questions from my coworkers <laughs> <laughs> um, about classes. So I know that they're talking about them to patrons again it's it's a little bit harder to assess that you know accurately mm -hmm. um, without I'm not a supervisor so without um, without that kind of overhead I, I can't do a ton about it right. um, but I guess there's to me I just think it's a it's a positive attitude and when you do mm -hmm. see someone um, pass out information to your about your classes or whatever, I often am like, oh, thank you. That seems like a great fit for that patron. I'm really excited to see them there. Mm -hmm. And that may seem like a little silliness maybe, but I, I do honestly feel that. And um, I, I would suggest just saying that to the coworkers that you do um, that you do see hand out or do get, you know, get suggestions for classes from or have patrons going to classes. And again, just Making sure that they know that they're happening and what they are and what's being offered, I think, is the biggest. I mean, we're all librarians. We want to share resources. We want to, you know, get people the information that they need and the training that they need. Um, so you're not, hopefully, you're not trying to overcome that kind of barrier that if you supply the librarian with the information, they're going to disseminate it appropriately. Right. So. And um, definitely making it a positive thing. And I think reaching out to them more if you're just not sure if they're promoting it, chat with them and say, 
and I mean, you said what well, like, I like to comment. You said about how they ask you more about the classes because they've obviously either read what you've given them to hand out or a patron has asked about it. Um, if they're not asking about it, maybe go to them and say, so we're trying to figure out what's going on with the classes. What have you heard? What do you think? And just, you know, make it a thing that they don't open up the dialogue. Yeah. Open up the doubt. They can't not know about it. <laughs> At least. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you may sound really annoying, but you can hide a lot of annoying by perkiness. So. <laughs> That's an awesome comment. Yes. <laughs> Be perky <laughs> and positive, whether they like it or whether they are or not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, it looks like there's no other questions floating around out there right now, and that's fine. I think we'll wrap it up for this morning, anyways. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Jen, for coming on and and redoing this class for us, this uh, presentation for us here. Um, I think there's a lot of great information you can tell from a lot of the questions. A lot of people are interested in and in, um, having the same kind of uh, issues and problems with trying to run, get these classes out there and people attending them as you are. And I'm glad you got to tell us how you've been able to be be successful with it in, in your library. Thank you for having me. All right. All right. I am going to uh, pull back control to my screen here now. And should come up in a second. There we go. All right. So uh, throughout the session, um, as Jen was mentioning, particular websites and things, I do save them into our delicious account here at the Library Commission. When I post up the recording later today, you will have a link, one link to all of these um all the different sites that I gathered here um, for um, for the class and um, Jen will also be sending me her slides and that assessment the survey um, uh, yes. this after today and then that, that will be included as well for you to um, all to have access to um, our archive sessions go here on our website if you go to our Encompass Live website right beneath our upcoming shows we have a list of our archives and um, we post the recording uh, we'll have the handouts and I'll also have a link to the uh, as I said the our delicious collection of websites will be right over here uh, when it's ready and up um, probably later today maybe tomorrow you'll all get an email letting you know that it's available and it's out there. Um, so if there is, um, as I said, we are free and open to anyone to watch. So do share the links um, for our, sh our archives and our upcoming shows with anyone, um, friends, neighbors, colleagues, family, whoever you think might be interested in any of the topics we're covering here. Um, so for next week's show, I'll invite you to sign up for that one. Best new children's books of 2016. Um, Sally Snyder, who is here at the Nebraska Library Commission, she's our coordinator of children's and young adult library services. Um, she does book talks every year about up the best books that came out in the past year so she's got her best new children's book session next Wednesday and you can see on our schedule just two weeks from that on December 28th she has the best new teen books of 2016 where she'll be joined by Jill and Annis who is from um, our a librarian here at one of our middle schools in Nebraska to share um, the teen books so if you're interested in those topics please do go ahead and sign up for them also, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, please do give us a like over there, and you'll see notices of when our new sessions are coming up. Here I do a reminder that people can log in on the fly to our sessions. Um, when our recordings are available, all of that is posted on here as well. So if you are big um, on Facebook, to do go over there and give us a like. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning. Thank you very much for attending, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>